Welcome to Impact Discipleship. Today we're doing Proverbs 9, Speed Edition. <laughs> the reference to that from Danny, which was, that was the worst introduction ever. <laughs> but the, <laughs> no, it's fast. No, the, re the reference is that, you know, it is a short, uh, it's a short proverb in, in a sense, because maybe it's because of how much we've covered on the topic so far um, about wisdom. The title for today is called Wisdom or Folly. And we've spent so much time on, on, on wisdom in these first uh, chapters. And uh, even, even as it points out uh, a few other pieces in this, it's referencing the stuff we talked about. So for that reason, it should be a short study today. There's going to be a lot of like pointing back. Um, the most we'll do really is cross-reference a couple of scriptures, things that came to mind when I was reading the sections. There's just really two sections the first 12 verses, and then the rest. So why don't we do that? Why don't we read the first 12 verses of um, Proverbs 9, and then we'll jump right in um, and talk about what I see here. Wisdom has built her house. She has carved its seven columns. She has prepared a great banquet, mixed the wines, and set the table. She has sent her servants to invite everyone to come. She calls out from the heights overlooking the city. Come in with me, she urges the simple. To those who lack good judgment, she says, come, eat my food, and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways behind and begin to live. Learn to use good judgment. Anyone who rebu rebukes a mocker will get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. But correct the wise, and they will love you. Instruct the wise, and they will be even wiser. Teach the righteous, and they will learn even more. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. It will become, if you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you will be the one to suffer. So... The first five verses, you, you'll notice something. It's an invitation. And um, it's an invitation to a banquet. It's the invitation to a, uh, an elaborate dinner. And again here, and we've covered this before, wisdom is personified and uh, is making this invitation to come to the table. Right? It's, say, it's saying dinner is served. Um, and, and, and I want you to take this invitation and turn, in a sense, accept it, right? It's, it's a great wedding banquet that wisdom has set. This just start jogging some things in your mind. Wow, it's, it's making this reference. Slaughtered, it's slaughtered the meat. It's mixed the wine. It's furnished the table. It's sent out maidens with an invitation saying, hey, whoever's, whoever's simple, whoever, whoever is um, innocent, come. Come to, this, uh, come to this meal. Come and eat the bread and drink my wine. So it's an invitation to a, a dinner table, right? You could, right? Sounds very familiar, right? Um, I would like you, uh, someone turn to Matthew 22, one to Matthew 22. Whoever turns to Matthew 22, then leave yourself there. And somebody else turn to Luke 14. And leave yourself. I'm, I'm here. Okay, and then and then somebody to Luke 14 and leave yourself there because we're going to go in and out of that. I may just read this one thing from from the Psalms. I, this certainly has to be on your table uh, or on your <laughs> on your mind. When I when I was reading this, I was like, yeah, doesn't this just remind me of of um, Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me uh, in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You see that? You prepare a table before me. So there's, there's like a, a thing there about the invitation. You have to come to that table, right? You, you know, and, 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 it, and it's... It's saying something about coming to that table. 
You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs all over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The table is set. The question for us today is, are you ready for that invitation? Even your enemies can't stop you. But you can stop you. Mm. Right? And so, how can we talk about an invitation to a wedding banquet without talking about the two parables in the New Testament that have that same flavor, an invitation to a banquet. So um, whoever's reading Matthew 22, read the first four verses for the invitation. Yeshua spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calves have been butchered, and everything is prepared to come to the wedding banquet. Doesn't, doesn't that sound exactly like the invitation we just read in Proverbs 9? Yes. Now, before we, we talk about that invitation, um, if you're in Luke 14, read 16 and 17. This is a, an invitation to a great banquet. 16 and 17. Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. You see that same feeling, right? Now, the reason why we're using both of them, the New Testament calls one a banquet, a great banquet. One it calls a, the other a wedding feast. And they both have <clears throat> similar <coughs> responses, but for different reasons. And we're going to talk about those. Um, it's not the only place that comes to mind when I think of invitations in the New Testament. Um, because Yeshua himself, when he wasn't telling a parable, he, he even said, come come to me and drink, right? <clears throat> in uh, John 4, he says, For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink? You know this story, right? The woman at the well. From me, a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew, <clears throat> you might even say, If you knew the invitation, if you knew the gift, of God, and whom it was that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where are you going to get living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from himself for himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him shall never thirst. And the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. <clears throat> so you see um, this invitation, drink, come and eat, come and drink. He says it multiple times uh, in the New Testament. He says it also in, in John 7, on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It call, it's called the last great day. If you see in verse 37, he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. And he who believes in me, out of, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But the scripture never really says that. You can't find a Bible verse in the Old Testament that says that, but it's referring to this invitation to eat, this invitation to drink, right? And um, at the end of the book, right, the end of the entirety of the book, right, you have, you have the literal wedding Supper, the very thing this entire thing is talking about. The invitation we see in Proverbs 9, this, these parables that are talking about coming to the great banquet, um, and this teaching about living water culminates at the, at the end of the Bible with the actual marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where it takes place. And you'll see it in, um, your, your eyes are like twinkling over there, you're hearing this, right? It says... Listen what it says in, in, in Revelation 19. Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory for the marriage of the Lamb 
has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Got to keep this in mind. The wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, and the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you see the invitation? Same invitation in the banquet, same invitation in the wedding supper, same invitation for the woman to drink. And he said, these are true, the true sayings of God. And then, in Revelation 22, at the very end, he said, and the spirit of the, Lord, of the bride said, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts, come. Invitations. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. So, what's, what's the important part here, right? I think... It's not just the invitations, it's, it's what we do with the invitation. So if you are the one who's managing Matthew, go back to stay in Matthew, we're just going to continue in our reading, uh, starting in verse 5 now, Matthew 22. <clears throat> and look what it says in, in Proverbs 9, 6, right? Because it tells us what some people do with this invitation. Forsake foolishness and live and go the way of understanding. Don't be a foolish. What do you think the fool is going to do? Right? Forsake oh, foolishness and live. The fool, we might say, rejects the invitation. So go ahead and read that. Wow, these guys do worse than that. <laughs> so after getting the invite, they paid no attention and they went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army to destroy those murderers and burn their city. My goodness. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those who I invited to did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite the banquet, invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out to the street and they gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Ooh, does that he sound asked, familiar? <laughs> As Shiloh said, he has no drip. As the good word says, he asked, How did you get here with, without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him <laughs> hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where, he, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Many are invited. Did you see, you see what happens even after the bad invitation, the person who shows up, there's, a, there's a, a guest or a guest type who show up without proper garments. Is that exactly what we read is necessary to come to the wedding supper in Revelation when it says, let us be glad and rejoice the glory of God because the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. How? It was granted to her to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, and this fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The whole idea <clears throat> is that you have to come to the banquet, the wedding supper, and you have to be clothed in righteousness, which we know the only way to do that is through Christ. Mm. I love when Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians, he says, he's talk, he's, he's, compare, he's making a massive comparison to the sin in the garden which caused man to be clothed in shame, right? Literally says um, he, he found he was naked and he was ashamed, but he, but he was already naked. But he was ashamed and God clothed him in animal skins, Right? So you had the glory of God on humanity, which would have been nakedness, 
And in order to cover up the glory of God, you got covered in animal skin. Right? And the reality is, if you're not clothed in righteousness, you get kicked out of the banquet. Right? You see that? So he says in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 1, he says, For we know that our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. Right? He's talking about at, at, at your death. But we have this building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly, listen to this, desiring to be clothed in our habitation from heaven. Righteousness. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. You see that? The correction here in 2 Corinthians is the correction of the shame that took place in the garden when man, was, when man sinned, he became aware, aware of his nakedness, which was the glory of God, and he couldn't bear it. He didn't want it. And so God had to cover him up with an animal skin. This is the replacement of the animal skin with the glory of God, your habitation from heaven. So you see, you have an invitation. You have these fools that you know kill the the invite, the, those bringing the invite. You even have fools who show up. You know they're like, hey, I'm in, but they're not clothed in Christ, right? That's what that means, right? Not clothed in Christ. Now, this different parable doesn't say wedding, but it says great banquet in in, uh, in Luke. If you would continue now, which means we would pick up in Luke four verse eighteen. And you'll see fools uh, make excuses, excuses to reject the invitation, right? Where earlier we saw uh, fools make light. It says, the first verse, at least in the New King James Version, what, what uh, Danny just read is, but they made light of it. Hey, come to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Come to the marriage supper of God. And they made light of it. People do that, right? They kind of—they don't take it seriously. They, they mock it in a sense. Well, in in Luke's uh, gospel, this banquet invitation is met with excuses. Pick it up in verse eighteen, Luke four. But they all began making excuses. One said, "I have just bought a field and must inspect it." Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen, and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I now have a wife, so I can't come. Please excuse me. <laughs> the servant returned and told his master what they have said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and alleys of the towns and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. None invited will even get a small taste. Think about what he just said in Proverbs. He's like, hey, come. I've slaughtered the, 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 the fatted calf. I've set the table, I have the bread, I have the wine, but you're not going to taste any of it. He moves on. <clears throat> so, so what kind of person is this, right? This fool. It's a fool. He, he, the proverb is telling us, don't be a fool. He then likens the fool in, in verses 7 to 9 to this, this, a scoffer or a wicked man. And he says, by the way, you know, save your breath. Don't try to correct this person, right? If, if you need to correct somebody, correct a wise person. The scoffer will, you're only going to bring harm on yourself if you try to correct the scoffer, but if you correct the wise person, they'll appreciate you, right? Um, it also likens the wise person to a, uh, a, a teachable person. Uh, a just man. So dealing with a scoffer or a wicked man, you correct them and the character of such person brings retribution on the person doing correction. You know what, what it says, what, what Jesus said in Matthew 7, he said, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, 
lest they trample them underfoot and turn and tear you to pieces. So like, don't waste your breath on a fool. By the way, that's, that's gentle Jesus speaking, right? But when you deal with a wise man, instruct and teach that man, the man with that character will actually appreciate the correction. He will absorb what you offer and become even better because of it, right? Then, in, in chapter 10, it's why, why we're going to be able to end very quickly. Um, it, will not, it will require you to go back and do some studying, but just to save breath and not repeat the same thing over and over again. Literally, this verse is connecting. Remember, he's writing this whole thing, but he's connecting what he's saying here back to where we began in the Proverbs. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's exactly what he said in Proverbs 1.7. The second half of the verse is different. He says in, here in chapter 9, he says, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In, in chapter 1, verse 7, he said, but the fool, see the connection? Because he's talking about the fool here in, in Proverbs 9. The fool despise, fools despise wisdom and instruction. The foundation, I think, uh, Denise, I think your version actually used the word foundation, if I remember correctly. The foundation of wisdom is reverence in the Lord. The foundation of wisdom is reverence in the Lord. The primary objectives, right? If you want to know how to reverence the Lord, you must know what the Lord thinks first. You must see the Lord's heart first on every matter. You must honor the ways of the Lord in every decision. This is what it means. What it says here in verse 10 and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, what it means is the knowledge from the Holy One is understanding. Meaning, if you're reverencing God, you're getting knowledge from Him before you make your decisions. That's what it means to be wise. That's what it means to be wise. To the contrary, that's why he's, he's contrasting right before this the, 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 um, the scoffer or the wicked man from, from the man who's teachable. Because the fool, the scoffer, wicked man, he doesn't want to hear anything about what the Lord has to say. He hates hearing from the Lord. That's why if you offer your pearls to that person, it's a waste of time. It doesn't work. Then, wisdom says to us in verses 11 and 12, by me, by me, Days are multiplied. Years of life are added. If you're wise, you'll be wise for yourself. But if you scoff, you bear it alone. You see what's happening? The payoff, it's really very simple. The payoff of wisdom is a long, prosperous, fulfilling life for yourself. The foolishness, the cost of foolishness is a lonely, barren, unfulfilling life for yourself. So you have that, that encapsulation. Then, in the last verses, 13 to 18, you're going to hear something. If you've been following us since we've been uh, teaching Proverbs, and the reason we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, right, just a few pages, just to cover these verses, he, he now takes the personification of wisdom that we'll see we just saw and we've seen before, and he feminizes it, calls it a woman. Now, we've seen this before, and it's, it's, it's common to do that. We, we connected this when we first saw this earlier in the Proverbs because the wisdom of, of the Holy, the wisdom is, is, is reminiscent of the Holy Spirit, the feminine quality of God. And even in Hebrew, the Ruach, the Spirit, is feminine, right? So we see the, the Trinity. We have a father, a wife, a mother, and a child, right? In the Trinity, and, and those are and that father and mother are gender-oriented. This is what it says. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knows nothing, for she sits at the door of her house on the seat of the highest places in the city, and she calls those who are passing by, who go straight on the way. Whoever is simple, whoever is easy to convince, let him turn right in here. Come this way. Don't go that way. Don't go where? Don't, don't go to the banquet. <laughs> Don't go to, that, don't go to that, that beautiful banquet that was set for you. 
And to him who lacks understanding, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. What does that sound like? That sounds like indiscretion. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of hell. You see the contrast? Here's the wedding. I'm calling you over here to this wonderful invitation, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Don't go over there, you simple-minded fools. Don't go. Come to me instead, because the water I got is sweet, and the bread I got is pleasant. Come over here, but the simple person, the foolish person, goes there. They don't know what's there, right? The, the point here is not so much um, that the fool is a woman, but the contrast is because wisdom is a woman. Wisdom is a woman. Wisdom is a she. It says it right in the beginning of this chapter. We're going to show a few other places. Um, and, but, the, but the point is that it's used time and again in these passages, the, the temptation of the adulterous woman, the immoral woman, the harlot. We've seen this before. I'm not just throwing that in here, right? Because everything leading up to here, in multiple places we've made these teachings, What's being emphasized here is that the fool is the opposite of wisdom. And because wisdom, because wisdom is, is personified as a woman, Proverbs 1, wisdom calls out. She raises her voice in the open squares. Proverbs 1.20. Proverbs 8, 1, 1 to 3. Does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice, she takes her stand on top of the high hill, besides the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entry to the city, at the entrance to the doors. And right here in this chapter where we began, wisdom has built a house. She has hewn it out of seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has furnished her table. She has sent out her maiden. She cries out from the highest places of the city, come. I invite you to the wedding supper. And that's why, the f that's why in this passage, when we go into Proverbs 9.13, Solomon calls the opposite of wisdom a foolish woman. A foolish woman. Because the foolish woman is the quintessential op opposite of wisdom itself. The foolish woman is the perfect fool. But he's not talking about a f woman like, you get what I'm saying, right? You get, you get the concept, right? It's not, a, it's not a slight against women. It's just that wisdom is a woman, so the fool is also a woman in this passage, right? And then, in, in, um, and then right at the end, we'll finish with this. I want to tell you about some references, but here, here's, here's the risk. He says, whoever is simple, right? So with this foolish woman, this quintessential opposite of wisdom, is calling out to the person who can be fooled, the simple, the one who lacks understanding, the one who would think stolen water is sweet and the bread that eaten in secret is pleasant. So here's the snare of, snail of fools. You might want to write this down, or this note, these notes will be online um, at some point in the next few days when the video goes up on the website. The snare of fools. Think about this practically in your own life. Going where you know you should not go. Wanting what you know you should not want and doing what you know you should not do, and taking what you know is not yours, will land you in a place you deserve, but would not wish on your worst enemy, death and hell. You get that? This is the snare of the fool. This is the whole point of this chapter. 
the warning, invitation, wedding supper alert, banquet alert, the table is set, I'm inviting you, but out there is a snare, a snare for fools. The opposite of wisdom, a foolish woman is calling you and, and, and trying to trick you into taking an alternative invitation. That invitation is going where you should not go, wanting what you should not want, doing what you should not do, and taking what is not yours. Doesn't that sound like modern culture to you? Doesn't that sound like the world we're living in right now? It will land you in a place you don't want to be and you wouldn't even wish on your enemies. The last thing I'll say today, uh, last two things, is uh, in these notes and certainly right on the same website, um, it's really, really imperative. You get the, the, the teachings about the reference points here, the detailed explanations that came before this. In three teachings we did leading up to this, the lips of an immoral woman, and all, all of what that stands for, that's on the website. Um, the second half of a message called Don't Do That is all about immorality and sexual morality. And um, in chapter 7, I think it was, um, the real cost of a harlot. Another teaching. Three teachings we've done just in these first uh, eight, eight chapters leading up to chapter 9 that, that deal with that topic. So I would reference that. Last thing I'll say is what we're going to do next time I'm teaching here on a Saturday is going to be Proverbs uh, 10, much longer, 32 verses, uh, in a message called Wise Sayings. All right, that's it. We'll see you next time.